below 70 years of age. I think that indicates that the country's workforce is at high risk with very negative economic implications. In order to have any successful intervention approaches, the country must invest in the generation of accurate data about cancer. And this is about creation of cancer registry or registries in most of the sites so that we can be able to capture these. Besides, cancer studies should be given first priority in this country. And I believe as we run this conference through the three days, we'll have people talking to us about cancer because so far, cancer is interfering with our social fabric. Uh, there's one that I will want to talk to when it is only projected. I wish you could project for me the slide that I have next. This is from National Cancer Institute of Kenya, and is a figure on the prevalence of cancer cases in 10 counties. And what would surprise you is that if the National Cancer Institute can only capture 10 counties out of 47, then what about the other 37? You'd be surprised that little is known about the other 37. And that's why I'm proposing in this conference that we really have to work on capturing the prevalence in every sector, every county, every sub-county, so that the country can know what to deal with. glad it has come. I'm not very sure if the people on this side will be able to see it, but I want to share this with everyone who is attending this conference. It's not just right here. It did. <clears throat>
Now, because of time, I think we may need just to continue. The figure we are struggling to show will actually give us prevalence of cancer cases in 10 counties. We might not have the time to focus on every county, but so far from what I've presented, I believe it's as if it would be so natural to expect prostate cancer in males to be highest in every county within the country, and breast cancer to be highest among women in every county within this country. I want to surprise you with what we have from the National Institute of Cancer in this country. Check it is there. Can you show it now? Can we have it? Pardon? As you walk it out. I think let's continue as the technical team sorts it out. What I wanted to highlight from this figure nationally, uh, a very unique trend is being captured. And this is esophageal cancers. What is not clear to us is whether it is the technology that has been updated that we can now be able to capture many cases or the cases are just on the increase. And two counties in that figure. For now, Bomet County has very high esophageal cancer cases. You'd be surprised that Kakamega County is also registering very high esophageal cancers. And from that figure, what you'd note is that esophageal, cancers are the, esophageal cancer is the leading cancer in Bomet and Kakamega. You'd find, you are definitely expecting to find breast cancer to be the cancer among, please the one I've said it is esophageal cancer among women. 
esophageal cancer among women in Bomet. That's what you capture. In Kisumu, instead of uh, breast cancer in females being the leading cancer, it is cervical cancer. And so when pastors say that as researchers, we need to know where the problem is, there are issues here that need to be sorted out, particularly when we're talking about cancer in this country. When you're talking about cancer in this country, when technology fails, we go manual. <laughs> That's where we were before technology came. So it won't be a big deal. So I think I've highlighted what I wanted to highlight from the National Cancer Institute of Kenya. The fact that in Bomet, you find a prevalence of up to 30.4. These are among males, sorry, not female. 30.4, that's the prevalence. While in female is 21.8, that's quite high. And in female, if you look at what we have in Bomet as cervical cancer, is just 5.6. Colorectal cancer, that is 4.3. And so, esophageal cancer is taking a toll on us in some specific counties in this nation. In Kenya, we lack adequate capacity to properly carry out very specific things that would be very critical in designing any intervention approach to prostate cancer in particular. So we lack the capacity to carry out risk assessment. We lack the capacity to carry out screening. We lack the capacity to carry out differential diagnosis. We lack the capacity to do management for our conditions. And please, this is such, that serious. I know of a case where a male was managed for urinary tract infections for two years before he was diagnosed with cancer. And at that time, it was stage four. And that was the problem. We lack the capacity to make predictions of response to treatment. We also lack the capacity to carry out monitoring of the disease progression in affected individuals. That's where we are as a country, and these have to be sorted out. If you consider what's happening in prostate cancer, the existing diagnostic protocols are burdensome and costly to the public. Before any cancer is confirmed, this individual will have to go through urinalysis, blood test, ultrasound, digital rectal examination, MRI or CT scan, all that protocol, so costly to the public. And the final one, the tissue biopsy. In this, then we see the burden of having an invasive procedure. Is it possible to come up with something that is less invasive or just non-invasive? Must we go to the level of the tissue biopsy? It simply means, therefore, that we need new technologies to handle detection of prostate cancer. We need technologies can, that can be quick and rapid, less expensive, less invasive, highly sensitive and specific, the ones that can be able to enable screening and early detection of the disease. I think what we know in this country, for those in the health profession, the Kenya control strategy advocates for enhancing early detection and improving accessibility to diagnostic services so that this can better the treatment. The current approach to prostate cancer screening and diagnosis is guided by the PSA level, what we call prostate-specific antigen levels, suspicious digital rectal examination. Of course, the urologist would do a rectal examination 
just to see if the prostate gland is inflamed. Transrectal ultrasonography to show the status of the tissues and of course the clinical symptoms when a male presents and says I have difficulties in passing urine or my urinary tract is just blocked. And so that is what the Kenyans are able to capture. We look at that as so much limited when the world is going the biomarkers way. In all this, the only biomarker that we can pick is PSA. But the trend the world is taking is for us to get biomarkers for prostate cancer and other forms of cancer. And so it's important that we go beyond PSA, which has already been reported to be not specific and not sensitive. Not specific in a sense that the PSA levels can go up even when there is no cancer. The PSA level can go up when there's a disturbance of the prostate gland. And that makes the PSA not specific. And because we have lack of specificity, PSA cannot be used for differentiating prostate cancer and other forms of, other forms of lesions that affect the prostate gland. So it's important that we look for other methods. Prostate cancer prevention and control approaches should be focused on the use of highly specific and sensitive biomarkers. And even as we are gathered here this morning, and I'm telling you that my area of research is prostate cancer, I'll be able to report to you part of what we've been able to do with a team. And some of the findings are very critical in the management of prostate cancer. It keeps on coming and, all right, I think I'll want to be at that. For prostate cancer uh, medicine, we have those four areas that must interact closely to come up with a way forward. Informatics, knowledge discovery, here we're talking about artificial information based. We have data source management, so standardization of data, cross-level data integration, data sharing and privacy, and the lower part there is genetic testing, expression patterns, and we call that the lab or the experimental bit. I'm sorry, I've interfered with it again. We call the lower one the experimental beat, and that's where I am, the lower one, the experimental. Uh, of course, you'll have the clinical translation where we have specific uh, radiotherapy and chemotherapy approaches to uh, the management of cancer. But down here, we cannot do whatever we are doing at clinical translation if we don't have the information from the other three areas, and particularly the genetic testing and expression. And this morning I'll talk to you about expression of two specific biomarkers, and their, the findings we have are very critical to the management of prostate cancer. Ideally, this is where the world is going, that we would like to evaluate biomarkers at three levels, and the main thing, we would also wish to capture biomarkers that would help us use non-invasive or less invasive procedures. And so we want to capture biomarkers in blood, biomarkers in urine, before we get to the biomarkers in tissues. If we can get biomarkers in the first two, then we're done. We really don't have to go to the biopsy stage. And some of the biomarkers cut across. Still, locally, the tissue biomarkers are so critical. And I'll want to talk to you about androgen receptors and interleukin factor six receptors expression at the tissue level, because that is part of the work that we've been able to do. What you need to know is that 
these biomarkers, besides helping in the detection of prostate cancer, they are also critical in the prognosis, management, and evaluation of treatment outcomes. And so we can use them for detection, but we still also need them as we continue in the management of the patient. So the myomarkers are very critical. Though what we are saying, uh, what we are saying now is that it's possible, it's very possible to end up at the first two levels, the use of urine and use of blood, because blood is less invasive. Of course, urine is not invasive at all. And so if you look at the diagram that, I still need that diagram, if you look at that diagram which, we, which I'm showing you now, this is a kind of work that has been proposed, strategic cancer biomarkers and molecular screening research approach in this country. This research or study has received funding from National Research Fund, the 2020 uh, call. If you remember the 2020 call, we had three areas. We had cancer, we had locust, and COVID. So this study uh, received funding from NRF, and uh, we are about five groups. We have Masena University, we have Nairobi University, we have, uh, uh, we have Nairobi Hospital, then we have Strathmore and uh, uh, IPR, Institute of Primate Research. The five groups have come together. And out of the five groups, the only two groups that are doing prostate cancer, the others are doing other cancer. So Nairobi University and Maseno University are handling prostate cancer. And if you look at uh, the right-hand side, that is what Nairobi University is actually doing in the whole uh, research. On the left-hand side, that's what Maseno will, able to, will be able to handle. And what you see is that we are really interested in focusing on the urine and the blood uh, biomarkers, just to see if we are going to come up with anything. The only thing you appreciate for any molecular biologist that the Nairobi team is actually doing genomics the Maseno team is handling proteomics because we're going to handle it from the gene level. But at the end of the day, it makes a complete cycle because we're going to end up with a database that will help us know what kind of biomarkers that can be used uh, for the management of uh, prostate cancer in this country. And so I want to make a report of a study that uh, we have uh, carried out and uh, this was to investigate and evaluate clinical utility of androgen receptors and interleukin factor VI receptors. Clinical utility. When you talk about clinical utility, it's about diagnosis. It's about management. And so we looked at these receptors' expression in the tissues collected from prostate gland, sorry, prostate cancer patients. Androgen receptors play an important role in the development and progression of prostate cancer. In the hydrogen, in the androgen receptor signaling pathway, interleukin factor VI has also been considered to be a molecule that brings in synergy. That indicates that the receptors are also critical. And so we decided to look at the androgen receptors and interleukin factor VI receptors expression in the prostate, can in the prostate tissue of cancer uh, patients. So the main objective was to evaluate the expression levels of androgen receptors and interleukin factor VI receptors in patients of different Gleason score or Gleason grade attending treatment at the Kisumu specialist hospital. We did this and about 80 uh, stored biopsy or prostate biopsies. To determine correlation between interleukin factor VI, androgen receptor expression levels with the disease staging. And so we were just looking at the correlation. I don't want to go into describing the study design, the study areas, I really want to show us the results because then I've already said that we retrieved the tissues, so that qualifies this to be a retrospective study. We retrieved the tissues of about eight uh, patients, 
and uh, we processed these tissues to look at uh, the androgen receptor interleukin factor 6 expression through a technique that is called immunohistochemical uh, approach. So we did immunohistochemical uh, studies on this. After retrieving, of course, we simply cleaned the blocks and then the wax the blocks and we did sectioning and you were able to do the immunohistochemical studies. Of course, the procedure is here in the four stages. Uh, the paraffinizing uh, using uh, uh, removing sil silene and then rehydration in graded alcohol percentages then we use the heat induced epitope and of course uh, uh, rinse with uh, uh, cold water buffer and then we observed we looked at the immunoreactivity of the different stages and of course uh, we have the four categories here uh, score zero no stain we have one focal weak stain and then two those are stages uh, that any uh, any histologist would be able to understand and so for our results in the first place we were able to look at or record the frequencies of glias and score distribution in prostate cancer patients and if you look at the scores from six to uh, 10, I believe you can note that stage 9 and 10 had the highest percentage. Most of the tissues were captured when they were at the advanced stages of the disease. That simply means, if you are reading this, over 51% of the individuals reported for treatment when the disease was already in advanced stages. If you're looking at the 41, 41 here, and then the eight there, if you put these together, that's a bigger number. Then frequencies of the grade group, distribution in prostate cancer patient, you also see this when you use grade group, you'll see that grade four, that is stage four, and stage five had the majority. And what you see from this data is that quite a number of our patients are captured at a later stage. That even if you were to intervene, then you have more challenges than if these people were captured in the earlier stages. And you'll still want to appreciate that I said some of these is as a result of lack of awareness. Just like the case I've told you, somebody was being treated for urinary tract infection instead of cancer. By the time he ended up uh, at a urologist clinic, he was already in stage four. Then we have levels of androgen receptors expression in prostate cancer tumors. Here we're now talking about the levels, immune reactivity, the levels, which I'll also show you at some point again. You look at it, then number one, we have the frequency of 33 then we have uh, uh, 19. Simply high, higher, higher expression would be seen in the late stages. So 33 and then 19. In the other one, if you were to look at this histological sectioning, uh, histological sectioning, number E shows the expression. This one was a control, and you don't see the proteins, you don't see the density of androgen receptors like it is in this particular slide. And these ones were the earlier stages, sorry, the late stages. Here you have the earlier stage. I want you to note what I'm trying to say. In this slide, what you capture is that you have higher expression or higher androgen densities in the earlier stages, but low androgen densities receptor densities in the later stages. That information is very important. That finding is very important. The fact that androgen receptors are higher in stage one, stage two, but as you move to stage three, stage four, and stage five, the levels go down. Why do I say so? All the drugs that we use for prostate cancer use androgen receptors as the target. And so, when it is the target, and it is not there in stage three and stage four, 
the urologist will tell you they take their first round of chemo. They take the second one. The third one, they resist. Why do they resist? The receptors are not there. And so, we must change if we have to continue managing prostate cancer objectively. For this population, what we found out is that the androgen receptor levels decrease with advancement of the disease. And so we must change from our first line prostate cancer drugs that target androgen receptors. For interleukin factor six receptors, this is different. And I want to move and just show you the slides again. As much as this is E, what we captured in this finding is different from what we captured about the androgen receptors. For interleukin-6 receptors, the levels increase as the disease advances. Of course, if there's anything to thank God about is that finding, because then we have something that can replace androgen receptors. Instead of us using drugs that target androgen receptors, we must now shift and think of drugs that can use uh, interleukin factor six. For those who are comfortable with statistical analysis, we did the Spearman's correlation test, and this is about the androgen receptors. Anytime you see negative correlation, anytime you see negative, it simply means inverse proportionality. As one is increasing, the other one is decreasing. And so, as we increase in the grades of the condition, the receptor expression is decreasing. For the other one, this is IL-6 receptors. You see positive correlation. And for positive, it simply means a direct variation. And so, as the disease advances, we also have an increase in the receptor's expression. And so if there is anything that should be done now in as far as prostate cancer is concerned, is for us to think about changing the management regimen so that we can use drugs that target receptors that are available at advanced stages. That might not be the solution. The solution is that we have to make our people aware. We have to sensitize the population. We have to find a formula for having regular screening so that we can be able to help the males in our population. I think the discussion is what I have already captured. I have already talked about this, and I would simply go down in conclusion and say that majority of patients of prostate cancer present for diagnosis at advanced stage. The second thing in this finding is that androgen receptors and interleukin-6 receptors showed a negative and positive significant correlation respectively. So the androgen receptors negative, the interleukin factor 6 receptor positive correlation. And finally, we can say that the immunohistochemical immunoreactivity score of androgen receptor decreases with prostate cancer progression, but increased with interleukin factor expression. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you so much for listening to me. And I want to thank the committee again for inviting me to come. moving because I was very careful when I listened to Pastor Kesis. He said anything that is presented here, apart from his, must be discussed. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you for articulating and uh, sharing with us very important uh, information on cancer. This session is now open for interaction. And I believe we have several questions that we want to find answered at this time. So I would want to have it in this way so that we manage time. We are a little late. So we'll take three questions and then move forward. So I see one hand, then will be the next, then the next. So Daktari. Kindly. Thank you for the presentation. My question is, if the failure to capture the cancer at an early stage, is it a problem of technology or what is the problem? Do you want me to react to that first? No, it's okay. No, it's okay. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for articulating this uh, important topic, especially for us men. Uh, this is very, very important, but also important even for the ladies because the ladies stay with the men. And uh, my question is that um, you have talked about prostate cancer and uh, its prevalence and um, other forms of cancer, breast cancer and the like, but I didn't hear you say anything about uh, the prevalence of cervical cancer, and yet this is one of those that is uh, usually, uh, they talk about it as being a great killer in uh, women. Thank you. Can I handle that too? Yeah, we can begin with uh, the last one. Uh, I think uh, the cervical cancer uh, came at a time when he was still battling with technology. And I remember he mentioned that we have very interesting data from Kisumu County, that in Kisumu, cervical cancer cases are higher than the breast cancer cases. And uh, I know the next one will be uh, why. And, uh, of course, uh, for those who have uh, come across uh, uh, causes and uh, how this happens, you'd remember that there is a lot to do with the cervical cancer that has been associated with, uh, I'm not confirming because I'm not in any studies, uh, associated with lack of circumcision and uh, multiple partners. I have no evidence about Kisumu with respect to those two, but uh, I might also not be very far if I hypothesized that they could be victims of the two. As a scientist, all I can do is to hypothesize and then wait for the study. Uh, Pastor Kesi said we can go and search. Yeah, and uh, for Dr. Tari, uh, you didn't give the other option, you just asked about technology. And uh, I would uh, say yes, that uh, not being able to pick the cases has a relationship with technology. And in particular, I would really want to mention one that uh, uh, I know about. I remember until 2010, endoscopy could not be done in Kisumu. And so if it wasn't in Kisumu, then you, don't ex you do not expect it to be in Kakamega and Bungoma. And just acknowledge how critical it is in detecting anything that goes on in the GI. At that time in 2010, I think we could only do endoscopy at MTRH or Nairobi. And so, if the cases are increasing in Kisumu now, we would then ask ourselves the question I asked, could it be just because we have a way of screening 
or the numbers are just increasing? I think as scientists, that's a question we need to ask. Maybe the numbers were there, but we didn't have a way of detecting. I'm glad that we're coming out of, I believe we're coming out of the pandemic. When we were talking about our numbers, in terms of COVID, you know about nations around us that had no data. Not because there were no cases, but because there was no screening. And so it's possible that we can lack or miss the cases just because we don't have the capacity to screen. And for now, I think in this country, we really have to think about how we can develop our capacity to screen and the capacity to manage. And beyond the capacity where in this case it is manpower, we must bring the required technologies in terms of equipment so that we can be able to get them. I would tell you uh, in this region of the country, you'd be very lucky if you found a urologist to do a biopsy in Busia. Or if a biopsy was done in Busia, you'd be very lucky to get a histologist or a pathologist to report the slides in Busia. In most cases, the slides are read in Kisumu. So then, think of Migori, think of Kisi, think of Omabe. All these people have to come up to Kisumu if anything has to be done. You remember those years when as a country, you'd have only one surgeon at a district hospital or in a whole province and this person had bookings, his clinics, either on Mondays, on Tuesdays, on Thursdays, and if you missed it, then there you were. So it's both technology and lack of awareness. I think let us also be frank about this condition. We have those who don't know. Because the case I've mentioned here, this person who was being treated for urinary tract infection was just a mature Kenyan. But he did not know until the day when somebody said, no, can we think of something else? And true to that suspicion, when he went to the urologist, he was, said, he was told he had prostate cancer. And so all those procedures of urine urinalysis, ultrasound, uh, digital rectal examination were co conducted and biopsy ultimately, and it was stage four. And what we are now saying for stage four and stage five in prostate cancer, if we have to continue with androgen receptors, I've already reported to you that urologists are saying round one will be okay, round two, round three, they resist the drug. Why are they resisting? The receptors are not there because those are drug targets. Uh, two questions. Number one, there's a misconception or uh, something that is going around that uh, soya beans are associated with uh, uh, prostate cancer. And now our fellow Adventists are at risk. And uh, most people now are quitting taking soya drinks because of this uh, idea. I don't know if it's scientifically proven. And number two is uh, now we associate prostate with the advanced age. We say uh, this is a condition for the old people from maybe above 60 and above. Should I be worried if I'm below 18 years that I have a chance of getting prostate cancer? Thank you. Mm, uh, may I begin with the last one? <clears throat> now, you have every reason to be concerned about your prostate health, that one, there's no shortcut, the age notwithstanding. <clears throat> one, cancers are genetic. We talk about oncology, we talk about oncogenes. And so there has to be a mutation in some genes for one to be able to develop cancer. And what we have, what we know now is that Cancers also tend to run in families. And this is what I want to say. If you are 18 and your grandfather or father or somebody in your mother's line went down with prostate cancer, you have every reason to be concerned about your prostate health. 
because prostate cancer also runs in families. I was talking to Dr. Omondi the other day, a urologist at Kisumu Specialist Hospital, and he told me he was seeing three brothers after seeing their father. Three brothers after seeing their father. And that's how faithful genetic things can be that we run through families. So you have every reason uh, to be concerned. Uh, soya or not soya, one, I've underscored and pinned the fact that uh, prostate cancer is genetic uh, in a sense that we must have a gene that makes us susceptible and vulnerable to developing the condition. And uh, all genes of that nature will need something that will stimulate them so that they get to the disease status. And so if somebody's already hypothesizing that soya has got something that stimulates a mutation in the gene that causes prostate cancer, I think the right thing is just to do a research. But the truth is that we can have stimulus of genetic mutation uh, from any substance. Just like you still also have positive substances from plants that would bring down the genes or simply inhibit that stage that causes uh, tumors. It's also possible to have substances from plants that can stimulate uh, cancers. I would want to take the next three questions. <coughs> okay, all right. Okay, my name is Esther Angwini. I'm not from medical area, I'm from social sciences. My question is, and thank you, Professor, for the good presentation. Uh, I don't know the role culture plays as far as cancer is concerned because I know we belong to societies as you are carrying out your research how much does culture play as far as this you know cancer is concerned because when you are dealing with prostate cancer they start you know people don't feel free to disclose and everything Maybe you can answer that one. Thank you. No, it's okay. I think uh, I, I, like, uh, I like her question. And uh, it makes me contradict what Pastor Kesi said here, that uh, when scientists begin arguing like villagers, <laughs> if you don't get the villagers' argument, you will never formulate anything to help them. Okay. And so we must begin from there. <laughs> <laughs> We must, understand, we must understand their way of life, their perception, and their definition of this form of illness. We must begin from there if we have to help this society. Uh, please, I think that is very important in health, and that's why when you uh, look at Moi University, they came up with a program that was meant to be community-oriented. That m program was meant to expose the doctors to the community's way of life and how their understanding is when it comes to uh, heal health. So we, we, cannot, we cannot assume what the societies and what the cultures uh, uh, do when it comes to uh, prostate cancer. But I, I want to share in this uh, conference that as a country, we still have a lot of issues with cultures, and particularly when it comes to uh, gender issues and sex issues. I'm sorry for me, uh, I'm a physiologist, and so when we talk about anatomy and physiology, those are, uh, uh, those are areas that are related. But now, for us as a country, when it comes to anatomical issues, that uh, this thing is affecting the male uh, organs, we become reserved. People don't want to talk about it. Uh, I want to say it's there, it's happening, but it's a hindrance to the solutions we want to make in the theme that we have formulated uh, for this conference. 
If we're going to have solutions, I think we must get out of our cultural cocoons and just face the reality. It is very true what Madame has said, that a male would still not even want to discuss with a wife about his prostate cancer, oh, sorry, his prostate health, but can look for a friend and a brother. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's difficult. Uh, and I think uh, uh, that, that cannot be something for us in this conference. I believe you are not practicing that. We must try and get our cultures out of this. If we have to progress and get objective interventions, we must educate our people. I like it when I meet my son and uh, he's asking me about my prostate health. I, I have a son who is doing his sixth year in medicine and while in fifth year, after they were given introduction to reproductive health, I remember that evening he came home and he asked the mother, Mommy, how old are you? Umefika menopause. That's a discussion with a son and a mother. <laughs> there are supplements I'll want to propose once they go to me. So we have to be frank. We must begin. We have to become frank with one another. If you think you have a solution, let us give out the solution. But if you are going to hide in our cultural cocoons, of course, Mama, I am not saying today you go and ask him say about his prostate. <laughs> I'm not saying that. Eh? You, you have to know how to do it. Yeah, you have to know how to do it. But it is a critical thing. It is something that uh, socially is not fair to our uh, social fabric. It is a real, something that has got a very negative impact in our uh, social fabric. Because if, if the families, for example, the couples don't accept it well, then you, you can even have a case where a family separates. Yeah, because uh, uh, refin definitely uh, prostate cancer leads to erectile dysfunction. And so if at uh, 50 a man is already uh, exhibiting erectile dysfunction, and probably the lady is still strong, then you see how that can mess up the social fabric that we are talking about here. So I think what I can say is that it is true our cultures uh, have very negative effect, but we need to educate the people around us so that they know. Uh, some, some of these things, actually, we have to come out of them, whether it is between uh, uh, spouse all these children and the parents, we really have to come up and help each other. But you know, like I do, it has become so difficult for us as a nation to embrace sex education for our children. And so when you're talking about cultural issues, it's very complicated and it gives us a lot of challenges. Uh, we have uh, several uh, questions from the online platform. I believe you can respond to this. Thank you, Prof. My name is Felix Chepsiror. Uh, there is a question from Madam Asanat on Zoom, and she is asking, are there any studies on the reasons or factors for the dif uh, differential occurrence of cancer in the various counties in Kenya? For instance, why the esophageal cancer in Bomet and Kagamega counties? No study has been carried out to address the esophageal cancer status. And all we can do is to speculate. I have been in meetings where this is discussed. And for now, people are already hypothesizing that there could be something about tea and hot tea with esophageal cancer. That's an hypothesis. We have to do the study. So all I can say is that we have speculations. But then it would beat logic why then Kakamega and Bomet? Because here in between we have Kisumu and we have several other counties that also have T. Though if you looked at the slide, you'd have esophageal cases again in Meru. But let's say this that we have genetic 
predisposition. First, I don't know why you are nodding. <laughs> we have genetic predisposition to cancers. And so there has to be a gene running in the communities that make them share this susceptibility. There must be a gene running in those two or three communities that makes them susceptible to this form of cancer. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for your uh, presentation, Prof. I am Dr. Purnima, chairperson in School of Nursing. I have uh, two main concerns. Uh, the first one, in your research study, you have mentioned that the prostate cancer is uh, higher in cases. So I want to know what was the cause, why the number is increased, so what was the cause, uh, why they have developed the prostate cancer. And the second concern is what are the early prevention. Uh, so in your study, we have, you have mentioned that early screening, then what are the other uh, early prevention so that uh, some of the research, if you are reading, even it's saying that if you are eating more red meat, even uh, poor lifestyle, so I want to know uh, what are the early prevention for prostate cancer. Thank you so much, Prof. Thank you for the presentation. Cancer is a big concern to all of us because we live in fear that one day there is an egg that will turn out to be cancer. For us who are pastors, there are people we start praying for with a small problem until eventually we bury them. What is the cause? Because we talk of uh, cells changing. Now, the villagers' argument, which is online, is that somebody somewhere developed cancer. Just like COVID is believed by villagers. When I say villagers, I'm just referring to people who don't have formal education. <laughs> they believe that cancer, uh, COVID, was created in some lab, and so we are suffering. Could this be the reason why we are not working towards a drug and that takes me to what I said earlier. When I said that scientists should not argue like villagers, is we cannot arrive at that conclusion and say that, yeah, it was created in a lab in the US by rich people to reduce population. When, when an educated person argues that way, maybe if they're in other fields, but when they're in science. Uh, anything that uh, uh, I've not, uh, I've not uh, uh, interacted with in literature, I will not be able to react, particularly when somebody is asking about physiotherapy and uh, uh, cancer moving from one tissue to another. Uh, I think uh, I have no uh, reason <coughs> and scientific evidence for that association. But then what I know is that tissues of the same origin can be affected by the same condition of cancer. As long as it mat metastasizes, it will go to another tissues moving through blood. And there we are talking about uh, uh, mutations. And so we can have uh, uh, the cancer, uh, 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 form of cancer uh, moving from the prostate gland into the other tissues uh, of the body. That one is highly possible. How it interacts with the physiotherapy, I am not very sure. But then somebody asked about the cause of uh, prostate cancer. Uh, I think uh, that one is something we need to uh, talk about. Uh, and I would uh, just approach it this way. I've already said that we are talking about mutations or the gene that is supposed to control cell division. So in a cell cycle, the gene that is supposed to uh, control cell division uh, uh, is uh, it mutates and so uh, cell division becomes uh, disrupted and we have what we call uncontrolled, uncontrolled cell division. And uh, this would lead to uh, the cells increasing in numbers and also increasing in size. And so what I know is that prostate cancer exhibits a genetic contribution. So 
it's a genetic condition, or we talk of genetic predisposition. And this is evidenced by multiple affected first degree relatives, so it can run through families, so it's a genetic, it's a genetic uh, condition. Early onset prostate cancer at ages below 55, like our friend here asked, could also be because the condition is within uh, a family. And so one would have prostate cancer because it runs in the family. But I think if you ask what kind of genes then, I think I would go on and just talk directly about the genes that are involved in prostate cancer. Several genes and chromosomal regions have been found to be associated with prostate cancer. And one that I want to mention is BRCA1, BRCA2, and then we have mismatch repair genes. Of course, when repairs are not done, it definitely leads to a, a mutation. Then we also have the HOXB13 gene. Anytime we have those genes, then we're thinking of uh, a dismatched uh, prostate cancer tissue development, that is in terms of division and uncontrolled division. What it is is that it can come early when these genes are activated at that particular time, because it's about the activation of the genes. And the activation could be dependent on the diets we have and the environment that we live in. There are several factors that go into the activation of the genes. And so it's about at what stage when the genes become activated. Of course, uh, uh, for males, uh, we would be, uh, we have to get the physiologic uh, uh, basis and say that males become active uh, at the age of 13. But definitely marriage makes the male more active and that's when the prostate gland becomes actively uh, used. And it's at that point when we can pick a stimulus or something that will activate the particular genes. So as long as these genes are there, they'll just be waiting. When they become activated, then the condition will begin and then we get into cancers. Now, in, in terms of, of, of uh, uh, control, what I know is that with stage one and stage two, one can recover from prostate cancer, and this can be reversed. And from my talk, you'll remember that I said, the androgen receptors that are targeted by the basic therapies that we have are in high densities, and so the drugs will be able to reverse the prostate cancer. But then beyond the three, it becomes a challenge because the receptors are not available. And I've already reported that in most cases, they'll do round one, round two, they'll respond, but round three, they'll resist. And the resistance is because there is low density of those receptors. Is there any question I need to address that I've not talked about? Which one? Just remind me. We yeah, the, the early prevention, the, the early prevention. Uh, I, I really don't have uh, any, uh, any evidence of talking about early prevention. I would, uh, I would go with uh, uh, early screening and early detection. Because then we talk about prevention at that stage because we are preventing the disease from progressing from one stage to the next one. Yeah, but uh, uh, I know what uh, my sister over there is talking about could be inviting us to think about genetic therapy for this. That once we know that we are in families with these genes, can we do genetic, genetic therapy? And that would mean that we have to do a study. The only risky thing with genetic therapy is you don't know when a gene that is inserted will mutate to come up with another amorphous gene to bring something else. But I believe that's an approach we could think about, that we think about genetic therapy, that if these genes are available, can we eliminate them? If there's a mechanism that can help us eliminate them, as long as we know the chromosomes and the location of the gene, we can do a gene therapy. Do we have any final questions? If not, I would kindly invite the chair for this session to 
wrap it up and uh, invite the conference coordinator to give us the way forward. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Yemba, for coordinating the questions. And I once again want to thank uh, Professor Nguena uh, for the highlights that you have given. When uh, Mr. Correr asked the question uh, regarding age, I was kind of very uncomfortable here. <laughs> because uh, right now I'm approaching 70. <laughs> and so I have a lot of fears in terms of uh, uh, prostate cancer. So thank you very much for the insights that you have given us. Uh, I think uh, one of the lessons I have uh, taken is that I need to be one of those modern men who can go home and discuss my <laughs> prostate health <laughs> with Madame. Uh, so that if she can support me in any way, should that situation arise, then uh, I have uh, nothing to fear. So thank you very much, and uh, we would like to um, maybe invite you at another session where you can again talk to us uh, at a, maybe a bigger, uh, a larger forum, uh, especially even to our young people, our students here, regarding some of these things that are of uh, great, great significance to our health. Otherwise, thank you very much. Can we please give an applause to <laughs> Professor Tim. Thank you very much. I will now take uh, this time to give to Dr. Chibirango to give us the way forward. Thank you very much. Um, I'm so excited because yesterday I was whispering to someone and say, will this really take place? <laughs> and that person said, yes, it will. And uh, it has come to be true. Uh, witnessed by even people online, they have sent some messages of appreciation that this has been so educative. Uh, thank you so, so much, uh, Professor Gideon. Uh, we are watching still people online, although we refused all of you to uh, open. Uh, I think you understand that for us, we had again to uh, be in touch with those online. And uh, Professor Gideon, uh, those online, they are so excited and say this is so educative. It's good knowledge. Uh, I believe for we are going to be careful uh, if there's any way we can be careful uh, so that uh, we take care of these uh, possible diseases to many of us who are aging. Um, I want to thank you, all of you, again uh, because uh, you put aside each and everything to come and learn and share. Uh, the session, which uh, possibly you can say the first session is ending, and I want to give you some information from our dear Deputy, His Excess and Deputy President. He has sent a message that uh, he will be with us possibly from two. He has extended to two. Uh, right now, uh, if you look at the schedule, we are supposed to be winding up the first session and we hurry for our lunch and then come back. Uh, for those online, we also wish you uh, the best for the lunch or whatever you'll be. Uh, here, we'll just move quickly to the other room. Even if it rains, we have to go there because we want to keep time. Uh, the Deputy President, His Excellency Deputy President, he said he, he wants to join us at 2. Uh, so we are going to rush through and we come back. Uh, sharp, please, if you can swallow, those of you can remember our long old days when we could uh, sometimes be forced by the competition of scarce food uh, where we could swallow and then get another one. 
please, I want you to practice and uh, record it swallow as quickly as possible so that uh, by two, we are back to uh, welcome His Excellency, the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya. Uh, I want to thank uh, our Vice Chancellor, uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor, who has opened up on the behalf of the Vice Chancellor and uh, the Chancellor himself also attending. Uh, this is really good and it's a powerful uh, conference. Uh, so when we come, when you come back, I want again to remind you, chairpersons, uh, because of these uh, slight changes, we may shift our timing depending to what His Excellency, the Deputy President, will uh, say and uh, how he'll go about that. So we may have to extend some of these. Uh, members, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this program is actually being revisited and revised again and again. Uh, so when you come back, and especially after the DP, we'll again update you. But the chair, if we possibly postpone an hour, we just uh, keep yourself into that, or we may even reduce some uh, minutes of the presentations. Uh, otherwise, I want to thank you uh, again. Uh, we can again clap for our visitor once again. I don't know why it was changed. But I think those outside there were not hearing. Uh, do I need to repeat everything? <laughs> Good. Uh, so right now, it is uh, two minutes to the end of our first session. I want to... I want to request the chair of this conference to call uh, Kira and see, but I believe, but I believe I have faith. <laughs> <laughs> that things are okay. Um, as is checking, maybe let me say a few things in regard to the chair. Uh, I should go there now. Okay. I want again to echo what we have uh, said, re echo that. As far as the session chairs, I want to thank the first session chair, uh, Dr. Wahonya. Job well done. Thank you. Uh, as far as the session chairs are concerned, and together with the, the rapporteurs, what we are going to do in the afternoon, uh, we are going to have the breakout sessions after His Excellency, the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya. When we come back, we'll continue 
in this together, even those online, we are still using the same link, the same link which has been shared, the new link, even those online, please keep with that. And the, with that, we can even encourage you to forward it to any other who may be interested. Uh, so far, we are not restricting you. Uh, those who have paid for the conference and those who are still struggling, all of you, please join in so that we can give a warm, a warm welcome to our His Excellency, the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya. Now, after that, we'll have the breakout sessions. And this is how we'll go through those. Um, in this very room, in this very room, uh, we'll have, uh, those of you who have received the, the new uh, program, uh, we are calling this Hall One. Hall One. In the previous program, it was called the, um, yes, it was called the Hall One, but we have added the session. session. Those online, uh, because you are not physically here, we say you are in session uh, in the afternoon. It will be session 2A. So those who will be with individuals in this very room, but you are online, you will be in session 2A. 2A. Okay. Uh, he has not given me good news. <laughs> uh, let me continue by giving you this. Uh, um, the conference overview. Those who will be here, they are the people who are going to be chaired by our own Professor Jackie Obey, uh, the Dean School of Health Sciences. So physically, room one. Virtually, session 2A, during the breakout. And some of the papers uh, which will be presented in that uh, session 2A and in this whole one include the comparison of nutritive value of water and this is from, uh, again, our own poem tie. It will be here, and the, those who want to follow that, it will be in session 2A. And then we we'll also have another one, uh, analysis of nutritive and the medical value of selected the edible mushrooms, uh, still from our own uh, scholars here. It will be in this hall one. Those online, it will be session 2A. And then we will have another one uh, from an international uh, scholar. It will also be here. And then we can have the discussion. Concurrently, or oh, those who will be running in parallel to that will be in session 2B. Those online, you can also join in session 2B. Uh, the links are provided, and in case there's anything, uh, our own Mr. Joe Mutunji will let us know. Uh, so the session 2B, session 2B will be uh, chaired by Dr. Benson Chinuthia, and the, some of these are the papers from the, the education, uh, education circles. So if you feel you want to be you, to listen to the education circles, uh, you can be in session 2B. Now, each of these sessions after discussions will also continue. Uh, for example, in the session 2A, which is uh, this hall, uh, physically 2A, uh, those also want to follow business articles and, and the uh, findings you will still join when Dr. Ongeta will be cheering. There will be some other two in this. So uh, as you can see in the program, it was uh, initially from two, which is 14 hours, and it could go down to five. But with, due, with the new changes, 
uh, will still let you know uh, any development. Another news which the chair has shared with me, which has said it's not good news, he was telling me that there is no food. <laughs> In the next 15 minutes, he said that food will be ready uh, in the next 30 minutes. Uh, so that is what he has said. Maybe we need now to adjust it there. Let me see. Should we call upon because we have 30 minutes, but yet the DPs want to join us at 2? Uh, we need. Yes. So we need to use this time. Okay. Um, Madam Professor Jackie. Um, I wanted to call uh, one paper, but the technicians here are telling us since uh, XNS is coming, they want to use these 30 minutes to test something. And I think it's in order, let's give them this uh, time to test something. Uh, for us, we may... Uh, uh, with my... Uh, 